Dig your hand in the land and listen to my story. Feel the cotton, wheat, and corn, the riches and the glory. Feel the sweat and strain of those who worked before me. Dig your hand down in the land. Global agriculture has changed more in our lifetime than in the previous 10,000 years. But as with all change, conflicts of interest have arisen. Nowhere is this conflict more poignant than in the story of seed. In this film, we'll look at how the seed has changed in farming and in our culture from a sacred element and the giver of life to a powerful commodity used to monopolize global food production. This conflict between farming and business, between knowledge and control, between truth and propaganda, lies at the heart of the story of seed. Once a company starts to see royalty collections from every seed, it pushes its genetically engineered crops to replace the native crops that farmers and peasants have grown over millennia. We don't know what is in the ecosystem. We don't know what we have in it. So it's nothing to do with feeding the world. It's nothing to do with tackling some of these huge issues we, we're facing today. It's about control of the food sector, of the food economy. We begin the story of seed thousands of years ago, at a time when the earth was covered with disparate communities isolated by mountains, seas and deserts. A huge diversity of cultures, traditions and languages evolved across our planet, adapting to the many different climates and ecosystems. Over centuries, the individual societies developed different ideas, cosmologies, routines and rituals creating a vast bedrock of diversity. Today, there are still communities around the world who give us an insight into this ancestral past. All traditional cultures have been based on the recognition that the most important reason we are here on Earth is to play our role in maintaining life in its diversity. Because seed contains life, Seed has been central to reproducing the culture of life. And if you look at rituals in India, in Africa, in Latin America, seed is at the center of it. Koroni, Radova Rejambeu, Musimutuarova, Ramuzarela, Apalaya de la Oni, Witter Radele Zaudi, and Nerdoveri one is Audi, Musirichirima. Biare get on me again on to Beoni, George, Jumagaragia, Jadiaku, Kura Kurtaki Gongwana, on to Leni Yere, Utikiomba Kura and Buri on Cotena. As our forebears diversified, so did their seeds, and thus their crops. Long before Darwin articulated his theory of evolution by natural selection, men and women around the globe were practicing this very process, re-sowing seeds best adapted to their particular environment, and thus becoming a part of the process of evolutionary change. At the center of this change was the seed, which each year would be harvested afresh and could be stored, shared, and crossed. We 
are the inheritors of this rich global biodiversity. The more we look at seed and biodiversity, the more we realize that the level of intelligence in the seed itself and in the breeding that farmers have done by working with the seed has given us not just the highest level of biodiversity, but the highest level of quality of food, the highest level of nutrition. I'm going to be here. Farmers breed for resilience and therefore they breed for cooperative arrangements. They don't breed one crop. They know they must have many crops because the climate changes. They know they must have many crops because nutritional needs are diverse. The production of food in indigenous traditions for most of human history has been to focus on advancing biological diversity. At the turn of the 20th century, farming began to rely on technology, forcing people off their land and into the cities, as traditional skills and labor were gradually replaced by modern machinery. But as Europe became embroiled in two world wars, the chemicals produced for warfare were set to change the face of agriculture. With the world locked in conflict, new chemicals began to be produced in large quantities. And once peace returned, the companies producing these chemicals needed to create alternative outlets for their products. By making minor alterations, explosives and nerve agents were reformulated as fertilizers and pesticides. And chemical agronomy found its way onto farmland around the world. <laughs> You're now bringing a lot of chemicals and the need continues to grow. It's not static. And that need never ends. In a moment, the suelos empezaron a erosionarse, a desgastarse. Nosotros decimos que se hicieron drogadictos, es decir, se hicieron dependientes de estos fertilizantes. Fertilizer etina wa panda season A. Season A lengi wa panda bupa juma kendo. Utabadita na fertilizer. As the farmyard mechanized and chemical use increased, the story of seed was also about to change. Natural cycles of seed saving and sharing, which had kept business interests at bay, were challenged by a new breakthrough in seed breeding. New hybrid seeds, crosses of two inbred parent plants, produced genetically rich first generation seeds, which would quickly lose vitality in their second and third season. This natural process of hybrid breakdown meant that farmers no longer benefited from replanting their seed. Instead, they had to buy new seed each season. This allowed international corporations to privatize and control the profits from seed. In the 1960s, these corporations began a worldwide proliferation of their new seeds recognizing global agriculture as an untapped and hugely profitable market, they set forth to, in effect, privatize the world's food system. Farmers around the world left their traditional farming systems in droves, buying into a dream of greater productivity, less labor, and more money. Monocrops like tea and coffee began to replace indigenous crop species, and subsistence farming 
on which the local community survived, was replaced by these new monocrops, grown to export. As global food output rose, traditional farmers were being seduced into this new system, despite seeing their production costs rise dramatically, as new seed, fertilizers and pesticides had to be purchased for each new season. And they found their new crops became subject to unpredictable international markets. These farmers had unknowingly bought into a system which was proving less resilient, less sustainable, more expensive, and ultimately detrimental to their survival. Uh, what do you think are the consequences of replacing uh, many different varieties of crops, food crops actually, with a single crop that you cannot eat? I think the real concern is that there is an increasing corporate control of the seed chain and increasingly that means that a very small number of people are having a massive influence over the way in which farmers are able to farm. Traditional practices of saving seed are now under threat and what that does essentially is to put corporate profit ahead of the ability of farmers to feed themselves and their communities. <laughs> Pieces are linked together in two intertwined chains, forming a framework like a long spiral staircase. And in this molecule, you have an essential quality of living matter, the ability to reproduce, to make copies of itself. And of all the molecules known to chemistry, only DNA and its relatives have this ability. In 1953, Watson and Crick's discovery of the DNA double helix set the stage for one of science's most rapid advances, genetic engineering, the ability to move genes between cells, organisms, and species, soon became feasible. In agriculture, the possibilities of such engineering seemed limitless. Higher yields, greater resilience to drought, better flavor, and quicker maturation. But as this new technology emerged, it was accompanied by fierce debate as to its ethics. Meanwhile, the most significant role of this new technology was being decided not in the field, but in the courtroom. The United States Constitution gives Congress the power to pass laws relating to patents that gives its owner certain rights to an invention. Those include the right to keep others from making, using, selling, or offering for sale the invention that is described in the patent. Intellectual property laws had long asserted that patents could be claimed on new and proven inventions. But in 1995, the World Trade Organization proposed a radical change in international law. Under pressure from global corporations, they ruled that microorganisms and microbiological processes already existing in nature could be patented. Under this new law, a seed could be genetically engineered to contain particular genes which could then be patented and privately owned. As far as the seed is concerned, this leap in terms of property rights on life itself is the most serious threat to seeds of diversity, seeds of freedom that are in the hands of peasants. A year later, the agrochemical giant Monsanto produced the first GM crop in America, Roundup Ready Soya. 
which was quickly followed by GM corn and canola. The genetically modified seeds contained a single novel trait. They'd been engineered specifically to resist the toxic effects of the chemical herbicide Roundup, Monsanto's number one selling herbicide since the 1980s. To put in a gene for herbicide resistance, you now have a monopoly on the chemical as well, on this, as, well as on the seed that is married to the chemical. They are chemical companies first, but they are seed companies second. That is their principle. If you can control the seed, you control the profit from growing food. You create a monopoly when you're providing seeds which have been engineered to be resistant to the pesticides that are used on those seeds. The net effect of that is that we're seeing a vastly increased use of pesticides, which is one of the things that GM was supposed to be tackling. 20 years since GM first hit our markets, the promises of early research remain unfulfilled. Roundup Ready technology dominates the GM market in America, and now the story of seed would return to the courtroom as the full implications of patent law became clear to the world. And I'll never forget when my wife and I left our door here, the front door, my wife turned around and said, I hope to God I have a roof over my house, uh, over my head tonight when I come home. That's how close we were to lose everything. We had put everything on the line. And I, I feel sorry for the farmers that didn't have that opportunity have lost their farms, hundreds of them. Canadian farmer Percy Schmeiser had been growing canola, saving and breeding the seed for 50 years. But in 1998, some of his seed was found to contain the patented Roundup Ready gene. Whether it's seeds blown in from your neighbor's field, pollen flow by the wind or from bees, if that happens to you, you no longer own your seeds to plants, they immediately under patent law, become the ownership of the corporation. Percy was taken to the Canadian Federal Court for patent infringement. His defence, that the GM presence was accidental, was rejected by the court, and in 2000, he was found guilty. They had no record of us ever obtaining their seeds or buying their seed, but they said because our neighbour grew it and contaminated us, we should not have been using their seed. We ought to should have known. Well. That's completely impossible. A canola seed, whether it's genetic altered or not, or organic, or it's identically the same unless you do DNA testing. To date, over 140 US farmers have been prosecuted for the infringement of intellectual property over seeds. Thousands more have been investigated for so-called seed piracy. What are we supposed to do with seeds? Seeds are supposed to be planted, multiplied, used further adapted, etc., etc. That's exactly what's not allowed from the corporate mindset. The corporations sell us the seed or license us to use the seed in a specific way, in the way they are interested to use it, full stop. By controlling the seed, you control the farmer. By controlling the farmer, you control the whole food system. And that's the legacy of genetics in farming. Today, the GM market has spread beyond North America and established itself in Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, and now in India. Whilst the GM industry claims to be increasing yields and improving lives, more and more farmers are reporting new and unexpected problems. In the Indian state of Gujarat, hundreds of thousands of farmers persuaded to grow genetically modified BT cotton, a crop which produces its own pesticide, found that in time, the pests developed their own resistance to the crop. The rise of these super pests has forced the farmers to use ever stronger pesticides. Instead of controlling pests and controlling weeds, you are getting super pests and super weeds. So even in the narrow domain of weed control and pest control, the technology is failing. With the rising cost of seeds, fertilizers and pesticides, many farmers have been forced into a spiral of debt and the spread of GM cotton has been linked to a tragic increase of suicides among Indian farmers. In Argentina, thousands of small farmers have been forced to leave their land, unable to compete economically with highly mechanized monocrop farms. 
Many non-GM farmers have found it impossible to avoid the Roundup herbicide blowing in from neighbours' land and see their crops and their livelihoods perish. And with the mass exodus of farmers from their land, farm biodiversity has decreased still further. Traditional crops have been replaced. Herbicide use has risen dramatically and hard-learned knowledge and farming systems have been elbowed aside. With the loss of diversity, you lose your security because uh, diversity is synonymous with security. It also means li improved livelihood, it means improved nutrition, it means improved division of labor. All this would be lost to one crop. We have to realize that, that um, diversity means survival. Diversity means being able to continue to produce, being able to continue to be a farmer. And without that, I think it's, 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 it's very important to realize that it's, we, we're simply not being able, we will not be able to produce the food we need if, if we allow that this kind of diversity is further eroded. Behind the global push for GM and its emergence in new markets in Africa, Asia and South America, one message has underpinned its progress. That the developing world is struggling and impoverished and unable to feed itself. But that GM can turn around their beleaguered fortunes. Poor farmers out there, they, they're not really efficient and they have these old seeds and they need to, uh, to become more productive and then the problems of, of, with hunger in the world are being solved. That message is not based on facts at all. We are concerned about starving people in Africa. We are concerned about starving people in Asia. Let us be blunt about it. It is driven by the bottom line and the financial interests of those companies. It is not driven by any public a spirited purpose. So it's nothing to do with feeding the world, it's nothing to do with tackling some of these huge issues we, we're facing today, it's about control of the food sector, of the food economy. But in reality, todo se trata de un control por impedir que los campesinos tengan sus propias semillas y al mismo tiempo que haya una erradicación de lo que es la producción independiente de alimentos. Quisieran ellos ser las corporaciones, los que tienen la producción de los alimentos en sus unas cuantas manos, en sus manos. ¿no? It's because genetic engineering is bro being brought to us by the old agrochemical industry, which is interested in maintaining its agrochemical sales of herbicides and pesticides, while also establishing a monopoly control on the seed that Genetic engineering has gone in a totally wrong direction as far as agriculture is concerned. Today, the seed and agrochemical industry has largely fallen under the control of just a few key companies. Hybrid seed corporations like DuPont and Syngenta, agrochemical companies Bayer and BASF, and the GM giant Monsanto, Within this concentrated center of power lies not only the massive profits from seed production, but the decision-making and agenda-setting, which will ultimately establish the legacy of our global agricultural system. In this future, crop and seed diversity will be assigned to the dustbin of history at a cost that we're only beginning to comprehend. Touch the toil and sorrow in the soil Where the greenbacks never grow on what I borrowed Dig down and tell me where's my seed for tomorrow Dig your hand down in the land The agrochemical and GM industry claims that small-scale agroecological farming is backward and inefficient. But the reality is that in spite of the unrelenting pressures they face, it is these farmers who feed 70% of the world's population. 
These traditional farming systems use less land, less water, and fewer resources. They grow healthy, nutritional food and nurture greater crop diversity. They protect soils, water, and ecosystems, and they are proving more resilient in the face of climate change. It is these farming methods that can show us the way forward for real food security. Ecological systems, localized, biodiverse, are the ones that are really providing food, nourishment, health, and joy in eating for local communities. We need to de decentralize our food system, and if we have to decentralize our food system, decentralized seed provisioning, seed sovereignty must become very much central to food sovereignty. Thank you, if we don't take this opportunity, we are going to lose the city and lose the future. The future of all, the future of our children. So farmers around the world are coming together and are working for food sovereignty the right for people to produce their own cultural food. I don't think uh, the public should ever underestimate the potential power that they have should they choose to use it. You know, who would have thought that Murdoch and, and, and News Corp could have been brought low by, really by a, a sense of, of outrage. I think if we have a, a much bigger public debate around the kinds of agriculture that we want and the kinds of, of, of practices and techniques of some of those big uh, seed corporations, we might just get that same degree of, of outrage and hopefully uh, a, a system in the long term that's better for the people and the planet. Then if we look at the ancestral way, we find the solution to rebuild what has been destroyed.